great. You're in for a great ride today. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Ro, and I'm a student at Lehman College. Today we're gonna talk about the research we've been conducting for the last four weeks that's based on the New York City public education system, specifically data used from the New York City Department of Education. Let me just get quicker here. So let me give you a little bit of background on the New York City public education system for those of you who don't know, including myself because I didn't know this and I've actually been in the system since kindergarten. New York City public education system is the largest public, public school system rather in the United States with 1.1 million students enrolled, 1,800 schools across 32 geographic districts in all of the five boroughs. New York City also has some of the best and some of the worst schools in New York State. For example, as reported by the US News and World Report, of the top 20 high schools in New York State, 13 out of those 20 were actually in New York City. The first school uh, at the top of the list is actually the High School of American Studies at Lehman College in the Bronx. And now, how exactly are students placed from pre-K to 12th grade? Pre-K is something that's recent that started that's been implemented into the New York City public education system. So it starts in elementary school, and the way students get put into an elementary school is largely based on where they live, so where they're zoned. And elementary school zones are pretty small because you want to make sure that you go to a zone that's, or rather a school that's pretty close to where you live. And there's not much flexibility there. You can apply to a different schools outside of your zone, but chances are you're probably going to get into the school that you're zoned to. For middle school, it becomes a little bit more flexible. The zones are bigger, therefore you have access to more schools. For high school, things change a little bit. There are zoned high schools, so if you don't apply to any high school, you'll eventually go to a high school anyway. But with high school, you can actually apply to any school that you want to go to. So if you are a middle school, middle school student going into ninth grade, you can apply to a school in Staten Island if you live in the Bronx. If you want to travel that far and you get in, that's perfect. You can do that if you want to. And the school choice system actually changed recently. Uh, before 2003, the way it worked was that high school superintendents in each district had sort of the power to enroll, directly enroll students into public schools, which you can imagine probably made a lot of students unhappy with the schools that they got matched to. In 2003, with the help of Al Roth, a Nobel Prize winning economist, and other economists, that system changed. In the new system, students who were uh, not matched to a school, meaning that they didn't apply to the school, uh, that they, they didn't apply to the school that they got matched to, um, or they didn't get into any of the schools that they wanted to get into, went down from 30,000 students to 3,000 students. That means that the year before, 30,000 students had to be administratively placed into a high school, whereas the year after the change was implemented, that's only 3,000. It's a pretty big change, a really big improvement. And there are a lot of questions we can ask with this background and the data that we have, but we specifically wanted to focus and we were interested in asking these questions, which are how exactly do students move through the school system in terms of test scores, attendance, uh, et cetera, and how do students use the high school choice program to get matched to schools that they want to get into. Now, I am going to uh, pass the torch over to David, but before I talk about that, I do want to note that these questions couldn't be answered unless we had granular level data on student profiles and school profiles. And thanks to the New York City Department of Education, we, we were able to gain access to that data that gave us a unique opportunity to answer these types of questions. So David, the floor is yours. All right, um, thank you, Ro. Hi, I'm David, and I'm gonna get you really excited about our data. So, <laughs> Ro already uh, mentioned that this was like some really fine data, uh, uh, granular data that we had. So I'm gonna put that into a little bit better perspective. So we had 11 years of school data, ranging from 2005 to 2016. We had nearly five million students, 
1,800 school DBNs, 425 of which were high schools, and then we had exam scores for the ELA, math, region, and other exams. So we had, uh, we had 13 different tables that we were able to look at and go through their data, but there were three main tables that we decided to focus on. Those three being the high school rankings, test scores, and the June student bios. So going through each of these a little bit, so first we have uh, student biography data. So over here we have student ID scram, and what this means is that each of these rows represents a different student. So each number, each number is a unique student. And then next to it we have DBN, which would be a unique school that the student is, is in, and then a lot of um, personal information about the student, ranging from their grade level and poverty to their gender and ethnicity. And there's a lot of other columns with a lot more information in it. Next we have their test scores. So in the New York City public school system, there's a lot of tests that students will be taking. So to start, between grades third and three and eight, they have to take ELA and math exams, which are, ELA is uh, English language arts. Then in fourth and eighth grade, they also take science and social study exams. And then in high school, they take region exams. Region exams being these individualized tests by subject. So there would be like a physics region or an English region and so on. So in this, in this table, we have students individualized by a student, the year they took the exam, and then the name of the test and the score that they got. And we'll also have, if they took any other tests, like ELA or math, we'll have those grades too. So then, um, for example, I mean, okay, and then our, our last table that we have is uh, the high school rankings. So a little bit later, we're gonna go into greater detail about how a student will apply to high school. But for now, know that when a student applies, they have up to 12 choices that they can make, they, 12, 12 choices of schools they can list that they wanna get into. So for example, like looking at this student up here, um, this student chose M87A, which is Baruch College Campus High School, as their top choice for school they want to get into, and several others with their last choice being M12A, or High School of Arts and Technology. And take note that there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, mis a lot of uh, cells that have NA, meaning that the students didn't take all the choices that they could. So this student we have here took, um, cho um, put down seven schools and left the other five empty. So now that you understand what data we were using, I'm going to go into some of the challenges that we had. So for starters, this is really sensitive data. So um, these are all real students, and although the student ID is scrambled, we have to make sure it stays, it stays anonymized and that we have to be uh, careful with the data. And because of this, here I included a snippet of like a really intense contract that Jake had to sign to get us this data. <laughs> and then, um, so because of this, we, had to keep, we weren't allowed to download any of this data onto a personal machine. We had to work with it on an online virtual machine. So here you have our... Um, like, uh, well, this is the virtual machine we use. It has 112 gig that we were all sharing. So since we're all sharing this machine, we have to be careful about how much memory we use and how we code. Jake very kindly made a bot that would publicly shame us whenever we went too far and used too much. Here you can see Alana using half of our machine. <laughs> but, but granted, it was for a really important model that you'll see later. It was definitely worth it. I, I once even um, left my machine on and then left work. So everybody was stand with messages saying that I'm using too much. <laughs> And um, so yes, yeah, so from this we had to make sure we were careful and conservative when we were making our programs and how we were looking at data to make sure that we didn't crash our virtual machine. So in data science, I was, um, I was initially told that most data science projects involve like a big chunk of, the time, of your time is put towards data cleaning. So and our case and our project was no exception. So to start the data, we, so when we first got this data, we were like, wow, this is perfect. We can just put it into a model. We can put it on a graph. We, we're basically done. There's like no work here. But then after we started digging through it, we saw that there's actually a lot of inconsistencies. So like this student up here, in three, it's the same student, but in three different years had three different birthdays. And then likewise, this student over here, over the course of his student career, he switched from Hispanic to Asian to white to Native American. So like this could be a mistake or maybe an identity crisis. But either way, we had to factor for, this, for these anomalies. And then there were a lot of other things too, like there was ELA scores are supposed to be standardized to a performance between one and four, and we found a seven. But um, so yes, yeah, so we had to work with that. The next part about data clean that we had to do was that it's sometimes hard to interpret. So according to the New York City website, this is the official list of uh, region exams. As you can see, there's about like 20 tests that students should be able to take. But when we went through the table with them, we found over 300 region codes. So we had to really like go through it and understand what these codes meant and figure out what were actual tests and what weren't. So like in the 10 years of data that we have, one student managed to take the music region, which I, I had no idea existed. Yeah. And then finally, we have uh, naming inconsistencies. So when we're looking at students across different tables, so each year is a different file. And um, over here, we would have 2009, 2010, 
is uh, a si the science scores and social studies scores are separate. But then in 2010 to 11 and 2011 to 12, they're combined into one uh, file. And then likewise, across different tables, sometimes they'd have different names. When we're trying to compare grade levels, it could be grade or it could be grade level. And these might seem like little nitpicky details, but the point is that we couldn't just dive right into the, the tables. We had to first comb through it, understand the information, and then adjust it so we could actually work with it. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic to Kerry, who's going to tell you about student performance. So. Hello? Yeah. Hi, so I'm going to go over a bit of the descriptives uh, about uh, how students progress through the public school system. Um, first things is, even though we have a lot of data, there's, is the mic working or? Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. So even though we have a lot of data frames, there's not, not necessarily like a, a column in that data frame that says, all right, the student is like top one in the entire city-wide city uh, data. So we had to uh, define how we measure performance. So in each individual test, we had to rank a student's performance relative to other students in that year, in that grade. So this isn't uh, just based on the school. If a student is ranked 40, that's across citywide within the five different boroughs of New York City. So now I'm going to uh, discuss how uh, citywide test scores correlate with um, student GPA. As many of you are parents with students um, in the public school system, you might be wondering, at third grade, my student is taking an ELA exam. Is that really like like a good predictor or indicator of my student's performance. So um, we chose um, eighth grade because this is a really big testing year. So in eighth grade, students are likely to take ELA, math, social science, social studies, science. And um, if you attend a really good middle school, you may or may not be eligible to take advanced re regents exams. So what we see in this um, graph right here is the black line represents uh, like the average. The darker red shade represents the upper and lower quartile, and the lighter red shade represents the upper and lower decile. Now, if this were perfectly correlated, it would lie along the dashed line. So, to, uh, we just uh, so this graph is showing that their performance on um, test score uh, on uh, citywide exams are only moderately related to how well they perform in school. So, looking at this um, graph, uh, the first uh, like the top 10% of the students here you would see that they're in like the top 40% of, uh, of the citywide performance. Now, we want to see if um, early test scores and later test scores correlate. So if your student is like doing really well in third grade, would they also be doing really well in eighth grade? So um, here, I have three different graphs. This is showing their uh, fourth against the fifth grade performance, fourth against eighth, and fourth against 11th grade performance. So we see in the first graph that there's a very tight correlation between the difference of one year. So it, it, is, it is okay to say that um, uh, their fourth grade performance are very predictive of how well they will perform in fifth grade because there's only a one year gap. But then as, um, as we progress through different years, the gap increases and we see that the variance is increasing, like the variation in their grades is increasing largely and it's like going farther and farther away from the ideal dashed line. So now um, another way to put this into perspective is we took the top 10% of the students and the bottom 10% of the students. So I want to focus on this 10% of students first, and we see that um, the, their performance is slowly decreasing throughout um, the nine years that they are in the system. We see that um, there, to begin with, there are almost over 50,000 students who are um, in the top 10 percentile, but in the end, it's over less than 10,000 students. So we see that, that possibly there's a selection effect that we see here that the higher performing students are leaving the system, either going to private schools or leaving the state. Similarly, we look at the bottom 10% and the average is increasing. We see the same selection effect in that the students are either dropping out or similarly leaving the state. So now Francois is going to discuss uh, the churn in the school system. Hi, my name is Francois Azke. We just sh show you our student progress through the New York City system. So I will uh, continue by showing the trend in the New York the school system. 
So what are the dropout rate per, per grade? So we have, uh, by dropout, we mean students leave the system. So we don't, that's what, that's our definition by dropout. So we have a really uh, low dropout uh, starting pre-K to seventh grade. But when we, uh, by ninth grade, we see we have a really high dropout uh, grade rate. We have like about 30% of students leaving the system. And in 10th grade, that's a chaos. We have more than 40% students leave the system. And uh, only 15% uh, that made 12th grade that actually graduate. So those students leave uh, the system. And uh, the dropout rate per grade is a very important feature that Alan are going to use in the model we use to predict if a student is going to leave the system or not. So we, uh, pr from that uh, plot, we can see our student progress each year. So Yes, that's why we say so drop out. out yeah, drop out means a student leave the system. Uh, we asked why uh, we have a very high dropout rate in 10th grade. So the data set we have doesn't really give any information about what happened next. If, but what we can conclude from what uh, we, we, can, uh, we can say, students may move out of uh, New York City, so they go, from another, they go to another state, or they, go, they switch to a private school. And another thing, we think students may just take uh, the GED because at, at, at that grade, they're eligible to take GED. And another thing, we may think it's uh, at that age, students, they're old enough to get a job. So they just like leave school and to get a job. So that's one scenario we think that may happen. And what is the attribution uh, to the high school? So to uh, analyze our student progress in high school, so we choose a cohort. By cohort, we mean we have a group of students that enter uh, for the first time in ninth grade, and we see all those students progress each year. So for example, we have a cohort of uh, 20, uh, 2005. That means those students enter in 2005, and they expect to graduate in 2009. And we can see we have here 100% in ninth grade. We start uh, counting those students. And at the next grade level, we, we see in 10th grade, we have some students leave the system. And that's, uh, we have in 2005, that's dropped to about 90%. That means 10% leave the system. And we can see after 10th grade, the chaos, we have about 75% left. So students gradually leave the system. And we have about 60% uh, of students graduate in 2005. And in 2012, we have uh, about 70%. So we have a really uh, increase in the graduation rate each year. So that's a very good news for DOE. We have more student graduate each year. So the trend keep going up. So that's a very good, uh, good uh, thanks for DOE. And by graduation, we mean student just earn the uh, GED, a local GED. Uh, a local uh, diploma or they go to a regent diploma. We don't really count students that earn uh, a GED or the uh, specialized education diploma. So we just count students that earn uh, regent local or regent diploma. And uh, to have another perspective about the graduation rate, we try to facet it by ethnic group. So here we have, uh, in the data, we have four main ethnic groups. We have Asian, we have white, we have black, and Hispanic. And we can see uh, Asian have a higher, ch a, they're more likely uh, have 85% chance to uh, graduate compared to uh, black and Hispanic. Uh, they kind of overlap. We have black and Hispanic right here. And they have about 60% chance to uh, graduate in high school. So from those two last uh, plots, we can have that message. So if you are, uh, so we can see the, the Asian, they just like, they have a uh, black and Hispanic, they have a really low chance to graduate in high school. And we have another, we try to have another perspective. We facet it by gender. And we see a uh, female have uh, about 70, uh, they have about 70% chance to graduate and male have about 60% chance to graduate. So from the last two plots, we can have like a very good message. If you are a male and you're black, so you have on average, we have on average a 60% chance to graduate high school. And we have, uh, we present those uh, uh, 
uh, those feature. So what we can take from that? So we got, I'm gonna hand the microphone to Alana that will make some prediction about if a student gonna leave the system or not. So that's gonna be our prediction for what what happened next. Hi, I'm Ilana. So, as Francois mentioned, we saw all these different trends in the data related to how students drop out of high school. So it would be great if we could take all these different patterns and harness them in some sort of prediction model. That if we give the model a student and some information about the student, the model could t give us a probability of whether or not that student is likely to drop out. So the first step in making such a model is to determine what features about the students we want to give the model so that the model can do the best job at predicting whether or not they're going to drop out. So one such feature, as Francois mentioned in his slides, is grade level. That grade level, particularly grades level, grade levels 9 and 10, could be particularly predictive of student dropouts. Another such feature is attendance. So if we just take a quick look at the data, we see that in general students who have a relatively low attendance rate from 0 to 25 percent are have a very high average dropout rate as compared to students who have better attendances, attendance records from 75 percent to 100 percent, they have a much lower chance on average of dropping out. So this feature could be useful in our model. Another feature that we have is academic performance. So if we look at student GPAs on a 100 point scale, so in general, students who have GPAs from around 40% to 100% have an average dropout rate between 5 and 7.5%. But we see that students who have a GPA of 10 or who didn't have any scores at all listed in the data, so we had to give them a GPA of missing, those students have a much higher average dropout rate as compared to the other students. So therefore, when we built our model, we made sure to include these features, grade level attendance and academic performance that we saw from looking at the data could be highly correlated with whether or not students will leave the system. We also included other features that we thought might be predictive, such as poverty, as in whether or not a student is eligible to receive free lunch, gender, ethnicity, and some basic features about where the student goes to school. Um, that can help us assess whether or not that school is considered a good school, such as the school's attendance rate and the school's graduation rate, and the, how the students perform on average on regents, on regents exams in that school. So with this model, the model might be able to tell us that a fourth grader with very high attendance and a high GPA might be less likely to drop out than an eighth grader with low attendance and a low GPA. So once we have constructed such a model, the next step is to analyze how useful this model could be. So over here, we have a plot where if we take all the students and um, we take the model's predicted probabilities that those students are going to drop out versus the actual probabilities that those students would drop out. So ideally, we would want all of the points to be falling along this dotted line here. That if we say a student has a 25% chance of dropping out, they actually do have a 25% chance of dropping out. So we see overall most of our points are falling pretty close to this line, which speaks pretty positively for our model. Another thing that's interesting to note is that these dot sizes correspond to the number of students that we're predicting to have this probability. So we see most students we're predicting have a relatively low probability of dropping out. And um, much fewer students we're predicting to have a very high probability of dropping out. Some, so we have some other metrics also to analyze the model. So, if we were to have a baseline model that just predicted that everybody was going to continue, nobody was going to drop out, we would be right 85% of the time. So our model does just a little bit better than that at 88% accuracy. But this doesn't really give us the full picture. It would be more informative to know how does our model do, specifically in regard to the students that it predicts will drop out. So we found that of the students that our model 
um, identifies as at risk, meaning that they have a predicted probability of dropping out that's greater than half. Of those students, 76% of them actually were going to drop out. So that's a pretty significant statistic. Furthermore, just because we have a model that can, for every student, give a predicted probability for whether or not they're going to drop out, it doesn't necessarily mean that the school system has the resources to intervene with every single student that has a slight probability of dropping out. So what our model is particularly useful for is that it can sort the students in or from highest predicted probability to drop out to lowest predicted probability to drop out. And then if, for example, the school system only had the resources to intervene with 1% of the student population. So in general, there are about a million students in the New York City public school system in a given year. So if we were only intervening with 1% of them, that would be 10,000 students, which is still a pretty significant number even though it's only 1%. So if so what this plot is showing us is that if we were to only intervene with 1% of the students that and our model would tell the school system these are the 1% of students you should look at because they're most likely to drop out, we could be sure that pretty much all of them are actually at risk students who are going to drop out. So based on this, the policymakers and the people who are in the school can be sure that they are focusing their resources in the right places, that they're helping the students who actually need to be helped and that need to be helped, and that they're maximizing their impact with a limited budget. So that wraps up our first research question of how students progress through the school system. And I'm now going to hand off to Anandini to address our second research question. Hi, I'm Anandini. So, what is the choice? Sorry. So, what is the choice system? The with the, the with the choice system, students can rank up to twelve schools in any in any of the five NYC boroughs, and through a matching algorithm, the students are paired with the programs. Sometimes there are some unmatched students in the uh, left in the system. Um, they can update their rankings. Some years there are about two rounds, and some years we have about three rounds uh, where they can match their rankings again in the subsequent rounds. But the choice system isn't so simple. You can see there's this big giant directory where students and parents have to go through to uh, find out what schools to select. One uh, common way of selecting schools is based on which school is good and which school is bad, which is often assessed through rankings. And there are various ways to assess uh, rankings through student test scores, number of applications received, distance traveled, and graduation rate. Here we have two, uh, two, rank two categories of rankings. On the left, you can see standardized test scores, and on the right, you can see number of applications. What is interesting about these rankings is that you see Townsend Harris High School has a very high ranking by standardized test score and also a very high ranking by a number of applications. But then you see the Food and Finance has High School, which has a mid-range ranking of about 200, but receives a lot of applications and is ranked at number 8. So is the Pace High School, which has a, which has a 90 rank, 94 rank, but is number four with the number of applications received. We have some plots about, about popularity versus quality index. Uh, here you can see the school, uh, schools ranked by citywide scores and the schools ranked by the number of applications. And we can see that of all the 400 high schools in New York City, the, the schools ranked by citywide scores and the schools ranked by number of applications do not perfectly match. And that is why we have so much of a scatter rather than all of them al aligning, them, aligning on the diagonal. And we see Townsend Harris High School, which has a high school rank by score and also a high school rank by number of applications received. Uh, so does the Foundations Academy, which is low on both sides. 
but then again we see the food and finance high school which is an outlier in the system it has a mid range ranking but it receives a lot of applications uh this could be because uh, m- maybe many students uh decide early on that they probably want to go to a hospitality management college and like to get a head start in high school another outlier in the system is the high school for community leadership which even though it does really well based on student performance has a ve- has a very no- low number of applications received now rifka will talk about how to redistribute the students in the system Is it on? Okay. Hi, I'm Rivka. So Anandini just spoke about how the ranking system works and how students rank the schools. So let's look at where students actually end up for high school. So I'm going to look at it. We're going to look at a few maps now. So here is a here is the Bronx High School of Science. It is a specialized high school located in the Bronx, and we see that students are coming from all over New York City to attend this high school located in the Bronx. So the darker red means more students come from that location and so the, and the school is located in the Bronx. So we see that the students are traveling pretty far to attend this specialized high school in the Bronx. Now we're going to look at another high school in the Bronx, Intec Academy, which is Rose School, and we see that this school attracts students that live locally. There is relatively nobody traveling to this high school in the Bronx. You see here um and we know if we remember that students can choose to attend any high school in all of New York City they are not zoned to a particular school so keep this in mind so now we have another map this is PS192 a middle school in Brooklyn and this is the, showing what high schools do students from this middle school attend so the colors represent high schools and a darker color means more students from this school attend this high school So we see that from PS192 most students attend high schools relatively close definitely nobody's traveling far for high school and here we have another another middle school the Anderson Middle School which is the top ranked middle school in New York City they are the top school and we see that students from the Anderson School for high school majority of them attend this is Stuyvesant which is a specialized school in Manhattan and you saw earlier that um this school was the Bronx specialized school the Bronx High School of Science and those are both specialized schools and the Anderson Med- Middle School is feeding into this school so now that we we've, we've seen the maps and this data is pretty consistent throughout um so now we want to look at we want to understand why students are these students all had a choice of traveling anywhere in all of New York City so we want to understand Do students maybe not know that they have a choice or the schools available to them and how can we make this known to them of schools that they want and schools that they can go to for high school. So we designed a school similarity network which basically takes all the schools that are similar to a given school and will give you a list of similar schools. So it answers the question that if I'm interested in school A, what other schools should I apply to or can I apply to? in New York City. So some students let's say you live in Brooklyn and might not know of schools in the Bronx that would suit their needs. So our network we took the top 3 schools from each student's list of 12 schools that they can apply to as Anandini explained and a school called similar is if both the schools were listed together in the top 3 on any application. So the more times those two schools were listed together, the more similar those two schools are. And here's our network. There is a visual for, an app for this, you'll see later. Um so here are our five boroughs, Manhattan, Queens, Staten Island, Bronx and Brooklyn, and we see the links between the nodes here or the circles um represent schools that one student applied to both these schools. and the size of the node represents the number of applicants that this school received so i'll zoom up in a moment but here um the number of applicants yeah so 
the distance between these two nodes represents how similar those schools are, meaning how many times the combination of schools appeared in our data. So here I'm zooming up to the Beacon High School in Manhattan, and we see that a lot of similar schools are also located in Manhattan because students tend to apply to schools that are local. So if we see the Beacon High School and we take the network and we focus on just that one high school, the top schools that, that are most similar to Beacon High School would be the Brew College Campus High School, Millennium High School, and these other schools listed. So if you're applying to Beacon High School, you, should, you might also be interested in these schools because they are similar in the way we define similar to Beacon High School. Um, additionally, the Bronx High School of Science um, is similar to the Bronx Academy for Software Engineering. And this could be really useful because, as I mentioned, students may not know of other schools. And also, schools could be, like new schools can open in the Bronx, for example, and students may not know of them. For example, here, the Bronx Academy for Software Engineering, that school just opened three years ago, and they get very few applicants, even though it's a very good school, because students just don't know about it. So thank you. I'm going to, Twa is going to continue discussing high schools. Hello. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Toa, and now I will continue our discussion about the high school application system. In particularly, I will discuss the question, can we predict who will be satisfied in the high school application process? And by satisfaction, I mean the student will get matched to their top choice, or they get an offer from the specialized high school that they apply separately. And the first thing we would do is to look at what kind of schools the student want to go to. This plot shows that information, and it is facilitated by home borrow. On the x-axis is the quality of the school that the student put on their first choice. And on the y-axis is the percent of applicants. Better schools are on the right, and not so good schools are on the left. As you can see, th th this has a heavy distribution over here, which means a lot of students want to go to good schools. However, there's disparity between the Bronx, which is the purple area, compared to other boroughs. The Bronx, um, applicants from the Bronx seem to opt for lower ranked high schools. This could be because they have lower academic performance, so they do not aim for very good high schools. Another possibility is that there are not so many good high schools locally in the Bronx for students who are not willing to travel far. This next plot shows the similar information, but facilitated by ethnicity. Again, we see a lot of students want to go to good schools. However, there's a disparity between Hispanic and black applicants compared to white and Asian applicants. After looking at what kind of school students want to go to, we now try to predict their, we now look at their probability of satisfaction. As you may guess, academic performance can be one of the strong predictors of whether a student will be, will be matched to their top choice. And this plot shows that information. On the x-axis is the performance the, of the student in the eighth grade, and on the y-axis is their probability of satisfaction. Again, as I said before, satisfaction means you get matched to your top choice or get an offer from a specialized high school. As you can see, here are the darker dots, which means a lot of applicants fall into this range. And these mid-performer students tend to have a lower chance of getting to their top choice compared to applicants on the two extreme ends, the top performers and the bottom performers. It's easy to understand that, oh, if you're a very good student, you get what you want. And for the bottom performers, we. Um, investigating into our data has shown that lower performers list the lower ranked high schools, so maybe it's easier for them to get into those schools. 
Um, so coming back to our original question of whether we can predict if an individual student gets satisfied in the high, high school application process, the descriptives that I just show you give us some insight about the trend, but it is at the aggregate level. It doesn't tell us for sure if we can use those features to predict at the individual level. That's why we will build a model. So this is our applicant satisfaction model. It will, it will use features including the applicant's demographics and performance, information about the middle school that they attend, and the high school that they put on their top choice. And it will compute a score, a satisfaction score, of whether you will ha have a higher chance of being satisfied or not. And how does our model do? Compared to the baseline, which means you predict every student to be satisfied, our model has an increase of 21% point in accuracy. Precision means that among all the cases predicted to be satisfied, 71% will actually be satisfied. And recall means that 69% of all the actually satisfied applicants are identified by, by our model. So it seems that our model is doing a pretty good job. And what does that mean? It means we have more confidence in using these features to predict an individual student's probability of satisfaction. And this model will be helpful in helping students to manage their expectations. We might not be able to ask them to change their background, or the middle school, or the aspirations towards certain high schools. But at least, we can let them know that if you put these, these schools, and if you have such performance, um, you will, this is your probability, probability of getting what you want. So now, Ro will share some final thoughts. All right, we've come full circle. So what is it that you really can take away from this, right? These are the top level things that we want you to consider after listening to everything that we've spoken about today. First, early test performance is just a moderate predictor of future success. And what that means at a basic level is that just because you performed really well in fourth grade does not mean you're going to perform really well in eighth grade. Same for the reverse. If you perform really poorly in fourth grade, that doesn't exactly mean you're going to do really poorly in eighth grade. That's actually very good to know because that means that there's hope for these students. And also a simple attrition model can help identify at-risk students. And that's the model that Alana spoke about. And what that means, and, and something that's really, really important, is that we can actually identify these students that are most likely to drop out. And for schools that have very limited resources, this is something that would be incredible to implement into the school system to allow these guidance counselors and school administration to really focus on the students that could need the most help. And in doing so, that could possibly increase the graduation rate for that school and increase the graduation rate for the entire New York City school system. Also, uh, as you saw before, there is a literal textbook of school choices. And it's really cumbersome and difficult and probably very intimidating for students to go at it alone and choose those 12 high schools that they are considering going to. I know that was very scary for me. And just because they have a lot of choices does not mean that they're going to go out of their way to go to school. In fact, a lot of students end up going to their local high school. And students from disadvantaged areas often do select lower performing high schools and that of course could mean because they are lower performing they might think that i would should probably go to a school that's maybe not that great um, or they just end up going there anyway and of course high and low performers have a better chance of getting into their top choice school and this is connected to what i spoke about just a few moments ago high performers tend to apply to high performing schools that makes sense. So they're more likely to get in there. And low performers, uh, unfortunately, also tend to get into the low performing schools, so they end up applying there. And these are really important to take away from this. 
because these are things that could be implemented into the New York City Board of Education system to help improve it. And we really hope that the work that we've done today and the apps that I'll show you in a few um, that we've published could help the New York City Department of Education improve and provide uh, better access to better education for any student, no matter what borough you live in, and for better academic success. And these are the maps in the network that we've talked about earlier. They are available online. We encourage you to check out both of these because they're really, really awesome. If I had to go back to eighth grade and I had these two resources, they would have helped me out a lot. I went, again, like I said earlier in the beginning, I was in the school system since kindergarten. I only spoke Spanish and started learning English. Um, Mom, you know how that went? And um, when, I, when I was in middle school, I went to a library convention. I went to uh, the Intech Academy, which is a magnet school for technology. And I actually wanted to draw. I did not want to do tech. And I did not want to go to this school. Um, so when it came to filling out my list of schools, I went to my guidance counselor and I said, I need help picking out schools. And she said, OK, put in Tech Academy first. I didn't know what that meant. I just thought, OK, fine. I'll follow your instructions. You're trying to help me. And I put in a whole bunch of other schools that she told me to put into. And I remember we were all really, really excited to get our choices. And I didn't get up, end up getting into LaGuardia High School, which is actually good <laughs> in retrospect. Um, and when I got my paper and it said I got into Intech Academy, I actually started crying. I was really, really upset. And I felt duped. And after that, I didn't trust that guidance counselor. It was a really sad day for me. <laughs> but I ended up really loving the school. It's the reason why I got into tech, and it's probably the reason why I'm here today. But it may not be the case, the same case for other students. So again, being able to see from middle school that I'm going to, where are other students going to, would have been really incredibly helpful for me because I would have been able to see, oh wait, I can actually go to that school. Somebody went there. Or similarly, if I wanted to know which high school, uh, rather uh, what middle school students are coming from for a specific high school, I could see, oh, this is a school that's similar to mine. I can probably get into that high school. And then I can move over to the school network and pick out that school that I'm interested in and see what other schools can I apply to. And again, I really wish we had this. Um, we, we should have this now. And um, I really hope that this is something that the New York City Department of Education considers in helping their students have a more informed decision in applying to schools, uh, to high schools. So they feel encouraged and supported and like they meet the right decision. And before we go into questions, I just want to say thank you to all of you for being here, of course, and specific thanks to Jake <laughs> and to Sid and Dan and Will. We would be nothing without you guys here this summer. They, they taught us more than, and I'm speaking on behalf of you, but they taught us more than I could have ever imagined I could learn this summer. Like, I, I go home and I, and, I, and, I, and I talk to my husband, and I'm like, I learned some crazy stuff today. <laughs> like, I did not think I could learn this. And I'm, I'm so happy because uh, it, it really made me see that where I belong or where I should be is in research. So I'm really happy and thankful that you guys shared your expertise and, and your time with us. And I hope that other students in the future like me get to experience this. Huh? You want to come? Oh, oh, there. There were also other people who came out throughout the summer. Um, Jacob, Matt, Brian. So if you're watching, thanks, guys. So, <laughs> all right, Jake, do you want to? We'll take questions. Oh yeah, sure, <laughs> of course. Do you all want to come up, or do you want to? this work okay all right questions we have lots of answers yes we do all right they're not on me though they're on you guys 
Okay, so we we have to name them. Okay, first of all, that was amazing. It's really, Thank um, you. really fascinating analysis, and I agree. I think it's going to be very useful to a lot of people. So I was wondering something in terms of the intervention for at-risk students. Um, you know, you you were saying, well, if there are only limited resources, it should they should go towards the most at-risk students. I don't know where one might find the data on this, but my gut reaction, I may be wrong, is that an hour spent with somebody who has a 75% chance of dropping out might be better than an hour spent with someone who has a 99% chance of dropping out just because there's too many factors to overcome. So I wonder, I mean, I understand as you slide down that curve, the number of people who have a, you know, 75% or more chance of, is, is, is quite high, but is there any data you could get, any way to approach that? I mean, it's hard because you kind of have to see what interventions have been done. Right. I think that one of the struggles that we had with this data in general was that when we say that a student dropped out, we don't know why they dropped out. Mm -hmm. So it would be great if and if we had data that said this student dropped out because they got their GED or this student dropped out for other reasons. And then if we had that type of information, we could incorporate, we could change our version of dropout to really just be the people who um, we think have the, who dropped out for the reasons that we think that we could, as a guidance counselor or a school administrator, actually intervene with and do something to help. Okay. Um, just to add a little bit more to that, um, I think it would be really important, and I don't think we have that data, but I think it would be really important to look at it at the school level because every school performs differently and we can't really put a blanket um, solution to each school. Um, it may be the case that, that, that you would be better spending your time with somebody who's 75% chance of dropping out than 99% chance of dropping out, but we'd have to form some type of experiment to see that. And uh, it, it would really probably fall on the school administration or the guidance counselor to really make that call uh, whether, because what if there's more students in the school that are 99% rate, uh, ch sorry, uh, mm -hmm. chance of dropping out versus that 75% chance. So it really depends on the school and the kind of makeup of the students that are most at risk for dropping out. Uh, I will add to that. Uh, I think ethnicity group, it's a really good predictor. We can show in the graph, uh, me and to our show, we have like for those kind of, for, uh, black and Hispanic, they are, we have a very low percent of graduation, so that's a very good predictor. Yeah, okay. you know so another question is when you have dropout, there could be sort of, well, I would almost call it good and bad dropout. So there could be, but I don't know whether I want to. Yeah. Sort of, you could have a dropout because I actually drop out because I drop out of the system, don't go to school at all anymore. Or maybe I drop out because I go to a private school. And those are very different dropouts. So do you, some of your data seemed, first in the beginning where you're talking about it, sounded as if they're all going to private schools. But then when you showed that the students with really high scores drop out much less, that theory sounded suddenly much less plausible. So is there some way from your data to distinguish these two hypotheses? No, do you want to it? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I can speak to it. I think there's nothing in, like, there, there is very little data that shows, like, the student dropout because of X, Y, Z reasons. We really can't figure that out because we have very limited data. We have a lot of data on each individual student, like, on their exact, like, specific test grade or you know, like their course grade, but we can't really speak about like, like we, we have no track. We can't like, we have no microchip on every student. It's like this student is now working, like getting their GED or like move to like the different state. So like that data we don't have available.
my question would be to you. So you've identified what schools people, uh, students should look at that you know are similar to the schools that they're already looking at. Is there also a way that you could look at um, which school, based on a student's characteristics um, that you have in your data set, at which schools they would do well? So kind of give them more of a recommendation without having kind of a prior of like what schools they're already looking at. Is that something that you've looked into? I mean, we haven't, but that, that is a really good idea. Like, <laughs> we, could, we, we could be like looking at individual student test scores and like, and seeing how they progress in school and if they did well or poorly based on those scores. It's definitely like a good idea for future work. I, I, let, me, let me add on to something. I also just don't think that it's very hard to like, you know, identify if a student will do well. Because like, you know, you get different motivations at different grades. So like, you're poorly performing, but like, you reach high school and it's like, you're, you're just getting on the grind. It's like, oh, I want to go to a good college. So your performance, like, like, as mentioned in the slide, we can't really determine like, student performance like, throughout different years because it's not consistent. A little, louder. Oh, a little louder? Okay. So, um, this is really great work, but I worry about a couple of things given my personal experience that I might have talked to you about. Um, so, when I came to the U.S., my first day of high school, I was told that, like, by a chemistry, uh, head of chemistry department, like, I shouldn't take advanced chemistry. Like, it was, you know, a, a terrible experience that I had in high school. So, my guidance counselor, told me I should I wasn't gonna get into any high any um, colleges and like I was probably gonna drop out of Stanford all this stuff so I guess my worry is one um, so if you are going to do some sort of recommendation of where students will do well for example um, if it's based on historical data um, I wonder like you know how do we like there's biases in that data, right? Like why students um, dropped out. It could be they, they could have been like um, encouraged to drop out, right? So I, I wonder like um, how we could we could think about this. I don't know. This is gonna be part of my research too. Though. That's why I'm bringing it up. But like, have you thought about this at all? Um, it's because it seems right now like we're trying to give to guidance counselors tools to help students, which is a great thing. But I also think there's so much entrenched bias in the school system. Um, given at least my experience and my family's experience, I kind of wonder like how we could use this approach to like look into that as well. Okay, sure. um, so I have actually experience with that. Um, I was a pretty good middle school student, and uh, when I wanted to apply to really high performing schools, when I spoke to the same guy's counselor and I asked her to help me out, she said I shouldn't apply to those schools because I wouldn't get in. And so I didn't. And I don't know if I would have performed well. Um, I don't think we'll know. Each student is, is different, right? And I, I think it, it is important to highlight that there might be some biases in these data. Uh, but it, it might also be important to just note what's the percentage of students that are male and female that go to this school? What's the percentage of students that are uh, Hispanic or black that go to this school? And let the parents and students make the decision based on that. They are always welcome to visit the school, but I think the human element of like the guidance counselor uh, being biased towards specific set of students or, or not, that part we can't fix. Uh, that That is what it is with the school. You can fix it a little bit in your, in your tools. You can make right. your machine learning better than the biases of human beings if you right. do some of the things that Tim is talking about. That's true, yeah. Um, whether they use those tools <laughs> in the way they're supposed to be used is up to them. Okay, I'm, gonna, but. I'm gonna just uh, get a couple more questions because we're a little short on time. You had a question? Yes, uh, so I kind of wanted to know a little, little more about the predictive dropout model. Um, so you included different features, grade level, attendance, academic performance. Did you look at any covariance between those variables before you, I guess, included in the model? And just talk a little more about that as well. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, as David kind of mentioned, we had some memory constraints and some time <laughs> constraints. So we had lots of like cooler features that we wanted to play around with, more interactions between grade level and attendance, grade level and um, GPA that we would have liked to play around with. But unfortunately, with limited time and limited memory capacity, we weren't able to explore everything that we would have liked to explore too. But hopefully, we will be able to in the future.
Like we don't, we can't figure out your identity crisis. It's like a personal thing. If there are multiple ethnicities, we assume the mistake and drop the rest. Like that's the personal level, and like there weren't so many, so we were like it didn't affect on the larger scale. In terms of the model, we would not encourage students to modify so much their aspirations in order to get a higher probability of satisfaction. We still want students to put what they really want in their top choices and just use the model as a tool to manage their expectations. Um, and it also the case that if in the future, if students start to change their thoughts, change their mind about oh, what schools I'm going to put on, it will diverge from the historical data and we will have to use the new data to retrain our model. similar choices. So if this, if, if, if a student chooses to go to this school um, and this school, that you would recommend this list of, uh, of facilities. Um, isn't that sort of antithetical uh, to the situation happening in the Bronx where most students are choosing to go to low performing schools? Um, how would you guys address that? Um, you're right, that could be the case. Uh, we we didn't really assess it based on uh, that factor. Uh, it was a pretty much just to give you a list of these schools that you would you might be interested in if you're interested in a school A. But we didn't uh, really see the factors like if this school isn't doing well or uh, if if this if the student if this school has a low graduation rate but the student still wants to apply to this school uh, and based off of this school those those schools are similar for that student uh, we we, we w that mo that network just goes ahead and gives you a list of similar schools based on the school a that you chose and also to add on that so Although there's a lot of specialties that schools will have, so a school will be good for like the hospitality business or in sciences, and the best of those schools are usually well known. So like the best use for this model would be to put in a school that you already know that you has an interest you like, and you can find other schools that are also good with those interests. Sorry, I know we have a lot of questions. So I'll just put one more. Sorry about that. I know some people have had their hand up. Go ahead, and then we'll just. I heard. I applaud all of you. It was great collaboration and great teamwork. I also applaud the person who got the data from the DOD. <laughs> yes, um, I work for the okay, School cool. of Education at Lehman College. And I know you're presenting to your family and friends today as your audience, but I'm wondering, this really deserves to have an audience of educators or people in the DOE. Certainly the data that you present about the Bronx can be brought to Lehman College, where we have faculty and people going out into the field of education where this would really impact uh, their practice. So if I can, I will see if there's a way to invite some of you or all of you to come up. I don't know whether you know the presentation can travel or who is your audience for the future, that this shouldn't be the end. I think the right last question. <laughs> <laughs>